just a couple things before we jump in. Um, Jean over here is going to speak a little bit more to sort of the process, but one of the things we really wanted to do is to sort of help kick off this pretty unique and exciting conversation about the future of Yukon parks and campgrounds was to share information, to share stories, and hopefully inspire people to really think big, dig deep about the future of our parks and campground system. And the problem we had, it was a lovely problem to have, was that there are frankly so many stories worth telling. So what we decided to do was we wanted to use a format that's called Pecha Kucha or Ignite or 20 by 20. That's a lot of words. Has anybody heard of any of those? A few hands. Okay, if you haven't experienced it, you're about to. It's pretty fun. And it kind of goes like this. Essentially, what we have challenged our presenters, and we've got a great lineup of presenters to do, is to share their story in six minutes and 40 seconds or less. And the way that works is every presenter has up to 20, I can't do 20, 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. And the benefit for you, our audience, is that you really get a distilled important message. The other part is it's actually really fun because it's quick, it's lively, it's exciting, and we hope that you leave with your brain jam-packed, that you come back and participate in this process as it unfolds through the fall. So that's the format. Now, you've probably noticed who's coming in. We have some guests connecting remotely. So bear with us. Uh, this is the cost of innovation. We're trying to do some new things. So we have someone coming in from Ottawa via Skype. We also have Darius Elias calling in from Old Crow. And because we want to work harder at making these types of things more accessible outside of Whitehorse, this is actually a Facebook Live event. So we've got a bunch of things going on, and um, we're just going to give it a shot. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, I think just to kick us off, uh, I'd like to ask Alan Kaprowski. Alan is the ADM at uh, Department of Environment, and he manages part of the parks shop. So he's going to share some words. Thanks, Alan. Great, thank you. I don't have 20 slides, and I don't think I have six and a half minutes, so I'll keep this short. Um, thank you again for coming out tonight. I know, as uh, our MC mentioned, there's a beautiful summer night for the Yukon, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us here this evening. Uh, this Talking Yukon Parks is a really important initiative for us to uh, develop a updated approach to our management of uh, territorial parks and campgrounds. Um, in the Yukon, I guess we have just under 13% of uh, protected areas. That would be the national parks, uh, uh, territorial parks, habitat protection areas, and more lands to be protected through the implementation of land use plans. Um, our event tonight is, and more to come over the, the summer months, is really focused on our territorial park system, our territorial campgrounds, our natural environment parks, our, our uh, wilderness and ecological parks, and our recreation sites. So we, I think we have uh, around 42 campgrounds and just over a thousand campsites and uh, just recognizing the evolving interest in our in our campgrounds and our territorial parks we really need to have uh, input into the future direction of our of our uh, management and development so really it's a, it's a great opportunity looking forward to the presentations I saw the lineup looks uh, very interesting and very informative and certainly hope uh, folks have taken copies of the documents outside, read through there, and uh, provide us with some input. So thank you again very much for joining us. Thanks, Alan. So just a couple things to pick up on this. Folks, this is not the only time, the only chance you're going to share input, but it's a really important part to sort of feed into that broader conversation. So to be clear, this isn't it. It's just the beginning of a bunch of activities that are going to continue through the summer and into the fall to really dig into this. So I just want to be clear on that. So our next uh, presenter is Jean Langlois. Uh, Jean is actually project managing this uh, project on behalf of Parks. Um, and we're going to put his feet to the fire a little bit here. So even though he's a project manager, we're still going to stick to the rules. So we've actually got Amy Law over here. Hi, Amy. Amy looks nice. She is nice. But she is a stickler with time. So she is going to hold Jean to the 20 seconds per slide. And we're going to see how that goes, OK? So as Amy gets lined up, I just want to read, uh, I've got a few notes for each presenter, a bit of a bio, uh, and a bit of some fun facts, just for kicks. So as I mentioned, Jean's with Parks. He's been in the park world for a long time. Um, uh, he was with CPAWS in Ottawa. He's now here. He has an MBA, which is kind of cool. Not many people in Parks have an MBA. And here is a fun fact about Jean. I have been bitten by a red squirrel and a flying squirrel. So there you go. 
and you live to tell the tale. Great. So as we get set up, we're just going to switch the mic here. Do you want to use this? Uh, this OK, perfect. Thank you, John. And sorry to be texting while you were speaking there. Uh, part of the adventure is I'm trying to feed one of the other speakers who's going to be joining remotely. And he asked, well, how many people are in the room? So I just took a photo and texted it to them so he knows who he's speaking to. So um, so thank you, John. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of this uh, parks strategy and regulations process. Um, uh, the, um, the goal of this event is to feed into a larger uh, public engagement process that we have going uh, to uh, help us develop a park strategy. Um, and the first, the first thing I want to say is you are here. Um, we are at the front end of this process. Um, and I know it doesn't work for everyone to not have a draft to comment on and have things to respond to, uh, but we want to be sure and get public input right at the front end. I'll come back to the timeline later, but that was the point for now. What is it about? It's about, as Alan said, Yukon's territorial parks. Um, 57 parks, 42 campgrounds, 15,000 square kilometers, and uh, depending how you count, about 110,000 visitors each year to, uh, to our various parks. You've seen this map outside. You'll see it again this evening. Um, gives you a sense of the diversity um, and the breadth of our system spread out um, across the territory. All the way from Watson Lake to Beaver Creek to Dawson. There we go. Um, so <coughs> uh, that system is composed of different types of parks uh, that are trying to address the breadth of what parks are, are supposed to do. So at one end, we have recreation parks like campgrounds that are focused on recreation use. At the other end, we have ecological reserves like Coal River Springs um, and lots in between. And why do we need a strategy? Um, it's, it's the long-term direction, the vision. It's the big picture that guides all the small decisions that our team makes every day gives that consistent guidance so that um, it doesn't make the decisions ahead of time, it provides guidance for making those decisions. Why regulations? Well, because some of what we do is not just how we do business, some of it ends up being in regulations. These are the best camping rules ever, um, but um, obviously they're not enough to manage a system of parks. So um, our, we need to update our regulations to meet our current system's needs. So why are we doing a strategy now? Well, things are changing. Our system of parks is evolving. You'll hear more about that later. Uh, the demands on our system are changing. Uh, we are needing to ensure the long-term financial sustainability of our system. And we want to contribute to diversifying the economy. And parks have an important role to play in that. So at the end of all this, in about a year, um, what you will see as a product is a park strategy, which is a document, and you'll also see uh, some proposed regulations uh, that help implement that strategy. So how does that differ from what we already do? Because I know many of you have already given us input on various things. Um, we gather public input a lot at parks, um, from comment cards to uh, participation in management planning, and we use that input to do real-time decisions um, on individual things. This is different because it's not about the individual things. It's about the whole that, that holds all those things together. So these are the underlying strategic questions that apply to the whole system and that are more long-term, that inform how we make the individual decisions. And uh, our purpose tonight, number one, is uh, you will see a few presentations from Yukon government parks and uh, uh, tourism as well, providing information kind of where we are today. We're going to see a, a range of perspectives, which is very exciting uh, from some of you folks in the room, uh, perhaps where you think we should be going. And then we're going to hear from the room, and there's a few ways to do that. If you haven't picked that up outside yet, please do so before you leave this evening. It has everything you need to know in there. I'm sure John has some surprises for us in terms of audience participation for this evening. And as I said, it's part of a longer term um, process. So after tonight, um, you will see um, an online survey in July. 
um, and other events, then going into the fall, we're going to disappear and start working on a draft. And so early in 2019, you should see a draft strategy and draft regulations. So people who like have something to respond to, that's going to be your moment. Uh, but meanwhile, we want to hear from you in various ways. Uh, EngageUConn.ca is the one website to remember but, uh, coming out of this evening. Um, and it, uh, it will be the go-to place throughout this process. Um, and, uh, and there it is again, because I want to give it to you twice to make sure you had 40 seconds to remember that website. Thank you. So what do you think, folks, for our, our first pilot? He did a pretty good job. Well done, Jean. So listen, here's a, yeah, double hand. Well done. So what's going to happen is I just want to say a few things. So we are going to move to our second presentation. I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. So I think what we're going to do is pull up Facebook. Look for a tech guy. Can't see him. Awkwardly wave. Hey, Finn. Hey. Good. I feel like you're a foreign correspondent up there. Oh, you can't see me anymore. Um, we've got, well, we've got this. How do we get what we need? Click on the video call button. No. Okay. As this gets going, this is Stephen Woodley. I'm going to tell you a bit about him. And Hello? do we have connection? Hello. We do. Stephen, this is John Glamorrison Whitehorse. Can you yep. hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well, Jonathan. Fabulous. Well, I'm just about to introduce you. Um, so kind of welcome to the Yukon. Folks in the audience, Stephen is actually Skyping us from Ottawa. So extra points, he's three hours in advance. And um, Stephen uh, is a bit of a keynote for us. Um, in the parks world, he, he's actually um, a bit of a celebrity. And so I want to read some stuff. He doesn't know this, um, but I just Googled his name, and it took me to the University of Waterloo, and this is what it said verbatim. Though he is certainly too humble to admit it, University of Waterloo alumni, Dr. Stephen Woodley could be considered the godfather of modern protected area management policy in this country. Not bad. From this time, uh, with faculty of environment to his leadership as chief ecosystem scientist with Parks Canada, our nation has seen few people as dedicated to ensuring our protected areas stay that way. Today, Mr. Woodley has taken his work globally uh, as senior advisor of biodiversity and climate change for the International Union of Conservation of nature. Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much. So uh, I, I wish I was in the room. This is our first step of getting you up here. So uh, do, can, can you see my, my first slide on the screen? Uh, no. You can't. All right. Well, we have our first technical challenge. OK. Um, We're going to sort it I out. I tried to share. Okay. As you I tried to share a screen with you. Do you have any other way to bridge? Yes. I think what we can do is let's try minimizing you keeping audio. Can you still hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. We're going to pull up your presentation, and maybe if you could just let us know when to advance it. So information for the audience. I will. Stephen I'll just... is not going to do a Pecha Kucha. We're giving him 15 minutes. Um, he has a number of, of slides. We'll just go through it, but about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. OK. So Stephen, we're just pulling up your first slide. I think we have it now. And um, the floor is yours. Just tell us what to do when. Thanks for joining us. OK. All right. Well, f first of all, hello to uh, UConn friends in, in the room. Um, I really wish I could be there tonight, and I hope you have a, a really rich and, and fruitful discussion. Um, I'm here in, in for a short period of time, because hopefully we can have some discussion, uh, to, to, to make the pitch that increasing dramatically the protected areas network in the Yukon is the right thing to do and the, and the best thing that you can do for conservation. Are, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yes, we are. All right. All right, so just change slide. 
this slide is is a bit of a dire slide to start with. It's it's world scientists warning to humanity. This paper came out this year, and it's actually the second notice. And if you look at the individual boxes, um, they basically chart out individual trends of eco ecosystem conditions or planetary conditions. If you look at box E right in the middle, this is the forest cover loss since 1992, not a happy graph. If you look at the next one uh, over on F, it's invertebrate populations uh, in, in the same time period, actually since 1970. So all of these things mean we have to do something radically different in conservation uh, because we have a problem. Next slide. So I just wanted to make the point, and this is Canada is not immune to this system or to the to these kinds of issues. I mean, uh, Yukon is a, is one of the most pristine places on the planet, but in our country, we're seeing equivalent types of decline in ecosystems and in species. We have 700 species at risk just in Canada, for for heaven's sakes, and the rates of species endangerment. If you just if you look at Canada. Uh, as a whole for mammals, reptili reptiles, and amphibians, they're the same as global rates, to my surprise, uh, they are. Next slide. So what's driving biodiversity decline in Canada? Everybody will know the answer to this question. It's it's several things, It's but, but up front and foremost, it's habitat loss and fragmentation. Um, also climate change, pollution, unsustainable harvest, especially in the marine area. Uh, invasive species, and then there's cumulative effects of these things acting together. But if we look at the key ones, um, habitat loss and fragmentation and unsustainable harvest, these are the exact things that, that protected areas can address. Uh, so we can we can use protected areas to to impact the most important uh, causes of biodiversity loss that we've got. And they're also important for the ones I've highlighted in blue. Um, they, they can, they can, if they're whole, uh, complete systems, they can do a good job at cumulative effects. And they are a bulwark against climate change, which I would love to talk about in more in more depth, but I don't have time uh, tonight. Next slide. This is a a slide that Stu Buchart uh, et al. did published in Science, and it looked globally at what is the state pressure and response um, to to this ecosystem problem in the world. We know the state of ecosystems, the, the A graph is going down. We know the pressure from various human activities is going up. But interestingly enough, our response is going up too. We're actually doing quite a good, quite a effective response to the problems that we've got, it's just not enough. It's just not enough of a response to to change A. So we got to do more things differently. So next slide, we've got the, the, the things that we can do differently is illustrated in this conservation toolbox of which there's many things here. Um, and private private protected areas, private conserved areas are, are first and foremost in the toolbox. They're, they're growing in terms of governance types. We have far more focus on indigenous protected areas, and this will be relevant to the Yukon. On private protected areas, this is important globally. And there's this new, new idea in the block called OECMs, or other effective um, area-based conservation measures. And, and this is a way to simply broaden what we do effectively with protected areas into, into a different model where they don't actually have to be protected areas. They just have to be effective at conserving nature. All of these things are important. Um, regulations are important. Economics or incentives are important, etc. So I actually, with a colleague, Jonas Gildman, I, I go to the next slide. I've lost. We actually looked at what works in conservation. We went through hundreds of papers and and where they had proper counterfactual um, uh, studies, which the scientists in the audience will know about, where where we could actually um, know for sure there was a there was an effect, and we looked at which ones worked. 
And, and when you look at the establishment management of protected areas, actually 74% of the studies showed that they had a positive effect, which is pretty good. Um, and very few of them show that they had a negative effect. So this, this stands out, if you can hit the slide button one more time, this slides out of what works in cons conservation as being the most important thing we can do. Yes, they protect habitat, but when they're, when they're properly managed and properly run and invested in, they are the things that work to save nature. So next slide. There is this strategic plan for biodiversity, which many of you in the room will know about. This is, uh, this is uh, the, under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the famous Target, Target 11, which is known as Canada Target 1, for some strange reason, uh, is under Strategic Goal C. This is to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystem species and, and genetic diversity. We're going full out on this as a country. Um, we're doing a good job. We have this pathway. The Yukon's very involved. Um, but, but if you compare us to the world, we're not doing that good a job. We, we're behind many, many countries at implementing this strategic plan for biodiversity, and we're really only focused on one target, target 11. We should be also focusing on the other 19. Next slide. So here's how we've done so far. This is the, our protected area network, and, and when you look at it as, as a number of green dots or green blotches on a map of Canada, it looks like it's pretty good. And, and it is pretty good, but it's only 10% of the country, only 10%. And we promised to do 17, and we're talking about, and we've talked in international fora about upping that rather dramatically. Uh, we're talking about 30% and no take in the oceans. We're talking about up to half uh, being, being protected um, on land. Next slide. We have a problem with the current system that we've developed, and I'll just highlight a couple of problems with it. One is that most of these areas are, are small. This is a cumulative plot of area of the number of protected areas, and you can see that we've got a few really big ones, and then it drops right off. Uh, the majority of them are small. If you hit the button one more time, it says 10% of the largest protected areas account for 30%, or 10 of the largest areas, rather, account for 30% of the area. So we have a few really big protected areas which are effective, and a whole bunch of small ones, and we all know from conservation biology that these are problematic. So what are we going to do about that? We know we live in, next slide, we know we live in this highly connected world. The world is just, uh, it's moving all the time, and you don't have to be a Yukoner to understand that the world changes from summer to winter, but it changes from day to night. Animals, species of all kinds are moving up, down, and around. And we haven't accounted for this kind of connectivity in our protected area uh, system. Next slide. So, so what we have to do is not just increase the number of protected areas, but move to connected protected area systems. This is a really well-known recipe now for success. Um, this is what we have to do if we're going to halt this dreadful biodiversity loss problem that we're in and, and, and halt biodiversity loss. Next slide. Interestingly enough, it's not just the conservation community that's calling for this. This is a report put out by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. That's the World Business Council. They, they call for landscape connectivity uh, a call to action. Um, uh, so why aren't we doing it here in Canada in a really big way? Next slide. This, I argue, is our no regrets option to develop these huge conservation networks where we can protect caribou and grizzly bears and and columbula and, and migrating songbirds uh, and everything else. It's going to mean that uh, we do comprehensive landscape planning, but in an era of climate change, which is which we're into right now, this is the only thing that's going to allow species sorting, movement um, for 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 both the fast and the slow movers uh, in response to to this. Uh, it's our best hope of keeping um, the most of our ecologies intact. 
these conservation networks. Next slide. Um, this is a map of the footprint of Canada, the anthropogenic footprint. Um, we probably have to take different approaches to different parts in Canada. Uh, the approach you're going to take in the Yukon to develop these large scale conservation networks is going to be different than in southern Saskatchewan, for example. Next slide. People are doing this already in the world. This is a map of Costa Rica. And the hashed ones that don't stand out very well are the protected areas. And the green ones are connectivity areas. This is their conservation network. And they're actively building this in Costa Rica right now on private landowners. They're paying landowner contracts. And they're doing it by a penny a pump at the gas to pay for ecological connectivity. This is just one example I could tell you about many more. Next slide. Um, there's, there is great work going on in Canada. This is the Dacho Land Use Plan, which many of you will know. This, this embodies this thinking in a really sophisticated way. It's not yet been approved by the government. Next slide. I work for the IUCN and we're actively trying to contribute to these conservation networks. We've, we're working with the Convention on Biodiversity to define what, the, what these other effective area-based conservation measures will be so that they really are effective and it's not just a way for governments to cheat to get to the 17%. We're trying to focus on key biodiversity areas, which is a whole new program coming to Canada. Where, because we've set up our protected areas often in the least important areas to protect nature, um, and, and the key biodiversity areas is a way to focus on the most important areas for conserving nature. We're developing a standard for what I've just been talking about, areas for connectivity conservation. That's going to roll out this year. And in order to make sure that our protected areas work, we have this green list of protected and conserved areas. This is like uh, sustainable certified timber, for example. These are sustainably, or these are certified protected areas, and uh, I challenge the Yukon to be the first one in Canada to to get a protected area on the green list. And then finally, we're thinking beyond the the 17 and 10 uh, current set of targets because these are in term. We have a task force set up to look at really what are the best science-based targets we've got um, to protect nature. Next slide. So we know the recipe for conservation success. Um, it's well published in the literature. It's not a secret. Uh, we just have to do it. And these are conservation networks uh, of protected and conserved areas and connectivity. They've got to have large conservation cores so we can protect things like caribou calving areas. We've got to focus on areas of importance for biodiversity. And, and last but not least, we've got to make sure the places are well run, that they're well managed, and we have sufficient investment. And probably in the Yukon, I wouldn't be out of school uh, to say that uh, there hasn't been a sufficient investment in, in managing your protected areas, um, even the ones that you've got. So that's it for me. That's my take home message that all, although all conservation actions are important, um, protected areas are the one that can really give us the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, current efforts are dramatically insufficient to change the trajectory of this big crisis that we're in. And, and, and we know the recipe for success. So I'll stop there and hopefully we can have some questions and dialogue. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. So you're right. I'd like to open up to the audience for a few questions, um, but maybe I'll, I'll kick off with one. And this might be a Captain Obvious question, but sometimes those are the important questions not to lose sight of. Why does conservation of biodiversity matter? Well, there's there's many many answers to that question. First and foremost, we're part of nature, and and nature keeps us alive. And, and as biodiversity declines, um, our, our probability of surviving in the world declines. It's, it's really as raw and simple as that. Uh, so if, if we want to have a future on the planet, we, we should keep nature intact. There's many other reasons, of course. There's an artistic or spiritual or uh, ecosystem service argument that you could make. This is a big topic, but for me, it's about human survival. Thank you. 
So would anyone in the audience like to ask a question? No questions? Well, maybe I'm, I, oh, there's a question. I'm just going to bring the mic over. And uh, if you could introduce yourself to Stephen and then ask your question. Hi, Stephen. It's Mike Walton. How are you today? Um, hey, Mike. <laughs> uh, Stephen, a compelling argument for the establishment of networks and interconnected protected areas. And you've spoken often of uh, the challenge of density and uh, city development and fragmentation. Uh, that one of the challenges here in, in Yukon is for many of us, when we stand on the top of a mountain, we can look out over uh, acres and acres, hectares and hectares, kilometers and kilometers of unbroken uh, green space. And the sense of urgency is not the same um, as you can appreciate in other parts. Could you just comment on what that looks like from your perspective and how perhaps we might address that? Well, th I, I think that's a I think that's a good point, Mike. Uh, probably the obvious answer is, you know, you need this. So why wouldn't you put it in place now when it's easiest to do it? I, I, if you go to a place like southern Saskatchewan or even northern Alberta, it's really challenging to do it there. You're into restoration and you're into um, many more land conflicts than than you have. Um, you have uh, First Nations populations which which want to do conservation. You have, um, uh, be, you know, before the development front gets to the Yukon, um, then why would you not put it in place now? Because because it's never going to be easier than it is now. And if people don't think the development front is going to get to the Yukon, um, I've got another story for you. <laughs> it's coming your way. Thanks for the uh, question, Mike, and for the answer, Stephen. We have time. We're actually on schedule. Um, we have time for one more question. Would anyone like to ask a question of Stephen? Anybody? Oh, there's a question in the back. I was hoping there'd be one. Hang tight. So again, your name and then the question. Hi, uh, my name is Kate. I'm visiting uh, the Yukon for the summer, looking at the phenology of uh, winter coat shedding in the mountain goat in relation to thermal change, ma mainly on the basis of citizen science and photography. So if you have mountain goat photos, come see me afterwards. <laughs> but my question, I, I worked for many years in Tanzania that has recently set up a national corridor plan where the corridors are designated as their own uh, protected area entity. So my question for you, Stephen, is if you can envision a network of, of corridors um, in Canada, much like the one you showed for Costa Rica, what are the main ways that those corridor areas, uh, how would they be different, differently managed from a, um, a protected area? Um, thank you for that. You were a bit broken up, but I think um, I got uh, at least yeah, oh, mo uh, most of it. Oh, and and thank you for bringing up the Tanzania example. Yeah, isn't it astonishing that a country like Tanzania is developing a an ecological corridor plan, Stephen, are you still with and us? and it seems like a bad idea for us. You yes, I'm still with you. Can you hear me? Stephen, are you there? Are, 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 Yes, are you? Can you hear me? Hmm. I am still here. <laughs> Stephen, let me just check. Yes, out I'm still here. So I don't know what there. happened to my sound. Stephen, if you're talking, you might Hello? be muted. We can't hear you. I don't think we are. Yeah, I, I am not muted. I'm not seeing a text, guys. I think we've lost him. Maybe what we can do is, um, Jean, can you text Stephen? Oh, he's here. Oh, Stephen, you there? Uh. Oh.
Can you hear me now? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. While Stephen is typing his answer, we have a Co pop. Co oh, hold the pop trivia. Stephen, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. All right. Good. We fixed the problem. Well, thank you for bringing up the example of Tanzania. Thanks for bringing up the example of Tanzania. Uh, it, I'm getting an echo, so I'll keep talking, and hopefully you're not hearing an echo. But it's astonishing that a country like Tanzania has a, a connectivity plan, and it's and it's not something that's endorsed by governments in Canada. I think we already know how to do it in Canada. I think the Yellowstone to Yukon is a smashing, shining example of 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 what needs to be done, and in fact, how to do it. it. It's amazing to me that they've gotten to this point without government support or government money, um, and, and it's a bit shocking. That, that they haven't got it. Um, somehow, we as a conservation community have to get this message out that that this is the way we have to, this is what we have to do to do conservation. And uh, the rest, many countries in the world are getting this in spades. And uh, I, I know we just announced 1.3 billion for conservation in Canada in, in the last federal budget. That's a huge, uh, a, a huge step forward. And many NGOs were, absolutely instrumental in making that happen uh, but uh, the the uptake by government in rolling this out by the provinces um, I, I sure hope it's there um, we've got three years to get to 2020 if we don't get there we should all be dramatically disappointed but I think we got to look beyond 2020 to uh, to re to conservation which really halts biodiversity loss that's the only metric that's important okay Stephen thank you very much for the answer and um, if I could get a final round of applause for uh, Stephen in Ottawa Stephen, I do want to recognize the amount of effort that went on the technical side to connect. So you've, you've gone above and beyond, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Take care, all. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Okay. On with the show. Our next presenter, Christy Horton, is part of the parks team. I got distracted with the technological piece. What I'm going to do, we have four presenters from Yukon Parks. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them all run. And then I'll pause, I'll bring them all up on stage and we can ask questions of them then. I think that will connect some dots and be more useful. So as Christy gets set up, I'm going to give her the mic in a second. Um, we also asked her to share some information a little bit about her. Um, where is it? Okay, actually, so Christy is a manager of park planning at Yukon Parks. Um, and you get to tell us your fun fact. Fun fact. Well, I've only been with parks for about seven, eight months now. I'm acting, and my fun fact is um, if you have pants to hem, which I usually do, even though I'm five feet tall, I love to sew. So that's my fun fact. Yeah. Oh, right. I'm keeping it. Okay. Okay, so hi, I'm going to do your Parks 101. So it's kind of taking off of what Stephen um, said and moving it into how um, the legislation and that kind of stuff happens within parks. So as Stephen says, there's protected areas and then there's um, what we have as Yukon Parks within our jurisdiction. We've got some parks that are protected areas in the middle um, and we have some stuff um, and parks that are outside. So our recreation sites and our campgrounds and then the Yukon government also has stuff that's outside of our jurisdiction, which we have as our protection areas. The purpose of territorial parks is to basically implement our final agreements, um, protect represented areas throughout the Yukon so that we can recreate, educate, and have it for the future generations. How do we establish parks? We primarily establish them through First Nations final agreements, as well as large-scale land use planning. And then we have um, the Parks and Land Certainty Act, which is what allows us to be able to establish them overall. We work together. We don't do this alone. We work with our First Nations partners. We engage the public and engage local communities to create management plans, um, as well as manage the parks um, throughout their lifetime. 
our management plans currently in our progress. We've got everything from parks that are implemented and we're in review stages to ones that we're still in progress and we're working towards. So it's a long standing progress that we work with with primarily our First Nations partners and others. Well, as one of the goals is to do eco-region representation, this is where we're at right now, but as land use planning and other final agreements end up happening over time, this map will change, hopefully. As Jean said, we have park types within our legislation. So we've got levels of protection anywhere from low to high. Read my first spelling mistake. Um, <laughs> and it all got messed up. Um, that really sucks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> from campgrounds to um, specific, specific sites. Um, it doesn't look like it's preserved. And this one did too. Um, so park zoning um, is another way that we enact, just like you do in a city, that allows where uses can go within a park and that's use from a high, um, that's the right high, um, types of use like campgrounds to a sensitive area such as um, some place that needs to be protected and have less use. Regulations come out of our act. Regulations, uh, they started out as mainly being related for our little tent sites that are all over our system, but we now have a system that looks like this, which includes the green um, wilderness large sites. And we need to update our sites, or our regulations, to reflect this changing need. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christy. I think that might be under six minutes and 40 seconds. Well done. So again, folks, that was our second of four presenters from Yukon Parks. We have, we'll build time after the fourth speaker. We'll bring them all up and have a bunch of questions then. So we are now going to go to Old Crow. And we're going to be joined by Darius Elias, who is on the senior leadership team with Vantec Witching Government. Um, Jean is actually going to call him in a second, and we're going to pass the mic to him. Before we do that, I just want to read this. So Darius Elias is a VG citizen living in Old Crow. Darius is part of uh, the Vantec Witching Government senior leadership team and was the former MLA for Old Crow. Darius has a diploma in renewable resource management and is a former Vantet National Park Warden. Okay, so we're gonna call in to Darius. We're, uh, we're waiting for Darius to call back to me, so maybe we have time for a question. We have time for a question. <laughs> Just joking, here we go. Live now? Yes. Can you folks hear him in the room? Oh. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was quick. Um, yeah. So, um, sorry. We uh, we're actually maybe even a bit ahead of schedule. So, uh, we have your PowerPoint up on the screen. We have your first slide up, trapping area 401, uh, and John okay. just gave you a great introduction. Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly, uh, well, first of all, I've never done this before, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Taunton Quachon, and uh, well, my voice is anyway, um, <laughs> and the Kwan and Dun First Nation, so Masi Cho, <laughs> and welcome everybody, I hope your, uh, I hope your spring is uh, turning out the way that you hope it would be, it's beautiful up here in Old Crow, and, uh, and uh, things are going good. I think it's, uh, I want to begin with a little preamble here, um, it's kind of fitting that we're talking about uh, our protected area network accomplishments in this 25th anniversary of the signing of the Vontet Kuchin First Nation final agreement. And uh, I also wanted to just convey that I'm very proud and honored to be able to speak about our elders' vision um, <clears throat> and also recognize the significant contributions that uh, our distinctive uh, Vontet Kuchin provide to the history, culture, economy, and the social well-being of our Yukon and Canada. And so while I'm talking, I'd ask that uh, members in the audience keep something in the back of their mind um, that when we signed our claim 25 years ago, it wasn't just for us. It was for each and every one of you in the building today. And, those, and the protected areas that I'm about to speak of are yours too. And so, you know, there's an old adage where there's no vision, the people perish. And But it's not just about us. It's about sharing a healthy northern ecosystem 
it's about setting an example for stewardship in this day and age. And it's about, for us as one touch, it's about manifesting our own destiny and securing our own future. And it's about having care and control of our waters, land, and wildlife. And so, you know, this journey began basically back in 1952 when the first Indian agents landed with a float plane in front of Old Crow. Um, and when they talked to the community, our leadership at the time, we, we told the Crown to leave Crow Flats alone. And there's a very special place in our traditional territory that took 65 years to protect. And that was the Fishing Branch Game Preserve at that time. And it was just a square box uh, drawn on a map. And the other thing was is that we, we secured um, a group trapping area, um, a very large group trapping area that was to be shared as one people, as one a people. And so now, in this day and age, those were very significant accomplishments, uh, pre-land claims. And um, it set the stage for a protected area in, in, in North Yukon that uh, we're very proud of. And so if we can go to the next slide. Yep, we're on slide two. Okay, I just wanted to give people in the audience because I, I can't see you. I don't know who's there, but this is just a regional context of uh, where Old Crow is and where our, where our newest uh, pro habitat protection area that we're just about to sign off. Actually, we're just in the final stages of uh, 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 Chile Chick, uh, where where fish come out of the lakes. It's called. Uh, this is a protected area that uh, that includes Category A settlement lands. Um, and it, it's a partnership with the uh, territorial government and uh, the Renewable Resources Council here in Old Crow. So that's just, uh, we can go to the next slide. Yep. And so, and just just for, if people can visualize square kilometers, we've got 55,548 square kilometers within our traditional territory that we have exclusive rights over. And so of that, um, when we are done, that's Ivan, the uh, Loon Lake, Black-Headed Loon Lake, or um, it's a territorial park that we're just beginning to finalize. We're going to be we're going to be con in conclusion of the vision of our people in, in terms of our protected area network. And so we've got 31,189 square kilometers approximately that's protected. And so it means where life begins and ends. It's 6,500 square kilometers. Um, this was the hardest and longest negotiated protected area that the Vontats had to deal with. Um, we've got, in, within that protected area, we've got the Fishing Branch Ecological Reserve and settlement, land, um, settlement lands, uh, very biological productive uh, small little areas. Um, they're 169 square kilometers and uh, 138 uh, square kilometers. And then we've got the Old Crow Flat Special Management Area, which is a very large area and includes Montana National Park and, and a lot of our Category A settlement land. This is our bank. This was uh, the direction from our elders was very strong and strict to ensure that Crow Flats is protected for all time so that those yet unborn were able to ensure um, who we are as one cut and that they had a place to go. And the, and the animals and birds and the fish and everything had a place, healthy place to go. And, um, and as I said before, we've got a, a new whitefish wetlands habitat protection area that's about to be finalized. It's uh, 468 square kilometers. And I'll have a map here to show you a little bit of regional context about where that is. Uh, we've also got the new Bell River Summit Lake uh, proposed territorial park in Dudzai Van, which is going to be 1,525 square kilometers. So again, 56% of our Vantat Kuchin ter uh, traditional territory is protected in some form or fashion. And those are approximate numbers that um, I wasn't able, there's a little bit of overlap with settlement lands and um, some of the parks, but I wasn't able to uh, delineate. I just kind of took a guesstimate. Uh, I took out about 3,000 square kilometers because they're, um, and if there's anybody in there in the crowd, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, the relationship that we have with Parks Canada or with the territorial government is, has went from uh, from the beginning of to mistrust, basically, in the community of Oak Crow to to a very comfortable and um, um, productive working relationship in these protected areas. So I just take this time to thank you very much. Um, and so if you look at the map there, um, on the left-hand side, that's the traditional territory in the uh, light uh, pink there on my screen anyway. 
and the red box is where the new habitat protection area is going to be. And then the, the one in the middle, in the green, that's the new uh, administrative boundary for uh, Dutz I-1. That's, that's going to be a territorial park under a specific piece of legislation that we're going to uh, partner with, um, um, uh, with the territorial government as well. And so they're, they're going to be connected here. And one of the things that I want to uh, let the crowd know is that uh, way back when, when we got this mandate to, to create a protected area network and ensure that um, um, all of these unique and special uh, lands and uh, um, uh, waters and, and um, habitat for uh, fish and wildlife, they all, this is a magnificent network of protected areas to share with everyone. And um, they all have their own unique characteristics um, I don't have enough time to get into all of them, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, under Chapter 10, under Special Management Areas, we've got three three schedules. Schedule A is One Tut National Park. Uh, Schedule B is the Fishing Branch Ecological Reserve. And Schedule C is the Oak Grove Flat Special Management Area. And they all have approved land use plans with our partners in government and boards and committees um, that are protected under the Constitution of Canada and under our agreements. And under Chapter 11, which is the North Yukon Land Use Plan, which is the only approved land use plan in the Yukon, uh, the recommendations was to create Dudzaivan and Chihili Chick. Uh, and again, that's where fish come from, Chihili Chick, and, we're, and Black-Headed Loon Lake, it's uh, Dudzaivan Territorial Park. So um, our mandate is almost complete, um, and we've, we've done this in various mechanisms throughout in our claim. And so um, I just want people to have that understanding. Um, let's see. Okay, the next. Oh, let's see. Um, at the beginning of this planning process, our elders stressed and stressed and stressed that once you're done, you treat these um, protected lands as one ecological unit. There's a Gwich'in word for that, <laughs> but that's what we broke it down to, and that's what we put in our management plans because, um, in our 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 friends to the to the east. Um, in the Gwich'in Tribal Council area. They have the Rat River Gwich'in Conservation Zone and the James Creek uh, Bichuqua River Gwich'in Conservation Zone. And our new Vialo brothers and sisters have um, Ivavik National Park uh, to the north of Vantat National Park. They actually share a border. And we've got Herschel Island. And obviously to the west, we have the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So we've, we've got a pretty... Uh, um, and, and, and tombstone in the uh, Chondek uh, Gwich'in area. And so we've got a pretty uh, um, extensive protected area network in, in, the, in the Arctic here. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, next slide. Yeah, 7,733 7, okay. square kilometers is the slide. Yeah, right? that's right. Our, our, our First Nation, when we signed our claim uh, so many years ago, um, <laughs> some of it's because there's, there's a lack of third-party interest in the north, but... Um, I think it's uh, a lot of our good work as well. But there's 7,733 square kilometers that we have surface and subsurface Aboriginal rights and title to uh, ownership on our on our uh, Category A settlement lands uh, within our traditional territory. And um, we've got lawmaking authority, self-governing self-governing agreements, and um, and um, we we use those areas a lot now, and as well as all of our protected areas, to create employment. Uh, uh, we partner with universities, we partner with governments, we partner with NGOs uh, for climate change, um, everything from NAFA jet, jet propulsion to uh, we test for mercury. We've got, we had 33 research projects going on last year, and we've got a lot this year too. So these protected areas play a big role in, um, in, in the global uh, climate change or the global contaminants or um, the health of our, our Yukon fish and wildlife populations. Um, that's important to note uh, as well. Next slide. Yep. Okay, um, I'm not going to read this. Uh, you can read that there, but uh, you know we value the empowerment of our people. And if, I'm, if I could be so bold as to give some advice uh, to, to the audience or to share with you, is that you really need a strong, uh, you, need, you really need a strong vision. You really need a, a community uh, vision. It's got to be clear. It's got to be strong. Your principles got to be strong. 
and your goals and objectives got to be strong. But first and foremost, when you first start, make sure you have a solid terms of reference. Because if you don't, things can go sideways in a hurry. And then you start building trust with your community and with your partners. Make sure that your leadership, your community leadership is well informed so that they don't get surprised about uh, about anything that's, that you're negotiating. And make sure that you provide every opportunity for every citizen to participate, whether it, whether it be on the internet or public or 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 uh, workshops or or however you want to uh, to want to create a a, um, a protected area. And make sure you have buy-in from the community because if you don't have that, you, there's no use even starting. So if you have a high level of uh, communication right off the bat, uh, you should be okay. Um, um, and, and, and that the final thing is when you do your management plans, make sure your plan recommendations and, or actions actually mean something, that, they're, that you can implement them and that they have tangible results and, and both parties have responsibilities in achieving those uh, recommendations. And make sure that they're well-funded too, by the way. Don't, don't put something in there that you can't fund. Like it's just uh, setting yourself up to fail. Um, and, and make sure that you're able to partner with basically anybody, including universities and stuff, because they really can get money and, and help you out. Um, uh, another thing that we have in all of our protected areas, uh, our heritage manager wanted me to convey this to you, is that we incorporate our language and all of our place names in, in, our, um, in every one of our protected areas. So, we've, so right now we've got approximately 40 um, place names that have gone through the Yukon uh, Geographical, Geographical Place Names Board. And we've got 350 to go, <laughs> so we still have some work to do on that aspect. But if you can incorporate the the local uh, First Nation um, uh, culture, uh, traditional occupation and use his, history, trails, networks, and all that other stuff, it, it really bodes well for for the strength of the plan. Okay. Good. Next one. Okay, am I good for time here or what? Yeah, I'm the the MC is getting a little twitchy. Okay, okay, I'll I'll hurry up here. Okay, like I said, we've got the only signed uh, regional land use plan uh, under Chapter 11. Uh, we signed it on June 9th. Um, under uh, Section 11.6 of our final agreement, and like I said earlier, we've got uh, 55,548 square kilometers, bigger than some Euro European countries, as you can see there. We've got 13 land management units within that. We've got four integrated management uh, areas, and it basically says the lowest to highest development, um, and it's based on the intensity of use. And we've we've addressed cum cumulative impacts, and uh, some of the recommendations, like I said, were to create uh, um, some of the uh, um, protected areas there. And we're well on our way to plan implementation. Um, Rosa is doing a good job with that, leading that. And the next slide is some of the North Yukon Regional Land Use Planning Goals. Um, I don't have to read all of those. You can have a look. Um, and if anybody in the crowd or um, any First Nations or any communities want to uh, contact our department, Natural Resource Department here in Oak Grove, please feel free to because we're more than willing to share how we got to where we are and some of the trials and tribulations that we experienced, and um, then we're willing to share that. So. And the next slide is – whoops. Oil and gas activity. Yeah. yeah. So we have to keep we have to keep tabs on past uh, and present oil and gas activity that are adjacent to our settlement lands or protected areas, uh, and so we do keep uh, we do keep uh, a close uh, watch on that. And and we've uh, we've signed off a um, you know a oil and gas engagement strategy for Old Crow recently, and we've also signed off a contiguous boundary with the Chondek which uh, which is the first for or well, second for us. We've got one with the Inuvialuit. So I just wanted to put that in there. And the next one, if you can go to the cost of food in Old Crow, um, you know, when we talk about food security and protected areas, you know, whether it be all of the country foods that we eat, um, these are some of the realities that single moms and, and our citizens in Old Crow have to deal with. You know, uh, $20 for a jug of milk or to wash your children's clothing with a box of pain for $40 and $65 uh uh, thing of flour, or you know, just just look at the prices. They're having lunch with the uh, eight dollar forty nine uh, 
49 cent uh, hearty vegetable beef stew that costs 99 cents in Whitehorse is, uh, you know, the cost of living up here is, uh, is, uh, is pretty important to recognize. So, and so the next slide is uh, for you. Um, that's fabulous. So I'm just going to turn the phone to the audience and uh, see what they have to say in terms of thanks. Is that clapping I hear? Holy <laughs> arousing applause. Yes, the, everyone was riveted. Um, thank you, Darius. And <laughs> I'm, I'm as shocked as anyone that this little system worked. So it seemed to work really well, actually. Yep. So uh, thank you from everyone in Whitehorse, and, uh, and uh, we'll chat later. Okay, I just wanted to say one more thing. Nitive uh, Guzu uh, to everybody. That means safe journeys. And I wanted to let everybody know that uh, the late Chief Joe Linklater signed every one of these uh, management plans. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. And now back okay, to bye. our MC. Hi guys. So that was great. Um, it was really important to get perspectives outside of Whitehorse and uh, this is part of trying something new. We're gonna switch gears a bit and we've got two great presentations. Uh, one, uh, Randy Newton, there's Randy from the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Back to back, we're gonna go to Don Reed at the Wilderness Conservation Society. So we're gonna pull, uh, pull Randy's presentation up first from CPAWS and as she gets ready, I'm going to read something about Randy. So, Randy Newton has held a variety of conservation and planning jobs, but the most unique was working as a field assistant in the Loon Research Project. It involved going out in the middle of the night, chasing after loons in a boat, netting them, getting blood samples, trying to avoid getting stabbed by their bills, oh my, or the syringe and releasing them back into the lake. Looks like he's traded in that for a desk job. Anyways, thank you, Randy. Over to you. Thank you. So hi everyone, I'm going to talk about how our park system has this amazing potential to protect Yukon's wild spaces and the stories that are so tied to them. And when I say the word story, I mean it both large and small, from experience to lifestyle to culture. And first I'm going to start with two stories of my own. So I grew up on a small farm near Calgary, and I remember as a kid exploring and riding horses through the native prairie that surrounded our home. And I remember it smelled like sage, and it was dotted with wildflowers like buffalo beans. And when my parents sold the land, those living things are gone, and now wheat or canola grow there instead. And for me, it's a little sad that that story of my childhood is only in memory, and it's not a story that could be lived in that place anymore. And it's just a small example of what's happened across the prairies over hundreds of years, bit by bit, story by story. These small changes have added up to incredible transformation and the loss of things like grizzly bears and tall grass prairie. But what if we could do things differently here? If we could grow, but also protect our landscapes, living things, and stories, and stay large, wild, and remarkable. That brings me to my next small story. I was in a remote part of Tombstone last fall, miles from anyone, when my partner and I flushed the huge flock of ptarmigan. We heard the crash of their wings, and we saw a hundred birds rise up in a white cloud. And that moment was so startling and beautiful that I know it will stay with me for a very long time. And what makes that story so different from my first is that it happened in a protected area, and so that story is protected in a way. And I know that you and most Yukoners have similar stories of being struck or shaped by the land. And since moving here has been so incredible, the number of people have told me, you know, I thought I was coming here for a summer or a road trip, but I've been here ever since. And there's something about this place that just resonates with people. You know what, I lived in Alberta for three decades and I can tell you that no one says that there. You don't hear it, let alone all the time like here. And I think if we look at this map, it can tell us why. The blue shows areas that still have wilderness, most of the Yukon, and the green and the red shows areas with a heavy human footprint like central Alberta. And we're so lucky here to have these wild places, these places that test us and teach us and inspire us and make us feel both large and small. But let's not forget that most of this wilderness isn't protected, except by its remoteness. 
And as technology advances, these places are becoming less and less remote and less protected. And if you look at that map, you can see we have some amazing protected areas, but there's also a lot of wild places without protection. Unless we do something about it, we can hope, but we just can't expect these places will still be wild. And so thinking about the places and things that we value is going to become more and more important as we grow and develop. And of course, many people welcome this growth, but it places responsibility on us to think very carefully about the landscapes that shape us and that we don't want to lose. This is so important because right now, the protection of special places isn't a given, even during regional land use planning. You know, I bet half of this room has paddled in the Peel watershed. But it's a remote place, and for a long time, there weren't that many people who knew enough about it to care about it. And the reason a lot of it is protected, or will be protected, is because of people who realized decades ago that they needed to bring people to the Peel, physically or through words or photos, to make them see how special this place was. Well, how many wild places could we lose only because too few people know about them? So I think this park strategy is an incredible opportunity to create a framework for protecting the full range of Yukon's landscapes and the lives and the stories that are tied to them. This is how we can protect places that might not yet have as many champions as appeal, but that are still incredibly valuable. And if we look at our Parks Act, you can see that in theory we're committed to doing this. One of the main purposes of this system is to protect representative areas in the territory. One of the things that means is protecting part of every ecological region in the Yukon. So we have a goal, but we're missing a roadmap. And so backing up a little, ecological regions are a good way to map out the diversity of our landscape and its different ecosystems. They're kind of like nature's neighborhoods and they're all unique. The green ecoregions on the map are actually quite well protected. And this map doesn't show the very likely protected areas for the Peel watershed. But you can see many ecoregions are poorly protected, those in orange and red, we could. Um, places like the Klondike Plateau. So we have about 20 and if we protect a portion of each ecoregion, it will go a long way to capturing the mosaic of wilderness that we have. These different environments shape our experiences and lives in different ways, and protecting them protects the lifestyles, stories, and cultures that are attached to these places. So we need to design a protected area so they can sustain an ecoregion's full range of diversity, both living things and landscape features. Computer modeling helps us do this, and research groups in the Yukon, like the Canadian Beacons Project, have a good handle on how to do it. This approach is really flexible because when you use it to lay out protected areas, you end up with a bunch of options. You can use those options and add what you've missed, things like culturally important areas. And so I know it's not a territorial park, but if we use Kalwani as an example, 80% of it is ice and snow. It's great habitat for mountaineers, but it's less ideal for other living things. The most valuable spaces for wildlife and for most people are on the eastern edges of the park. So if we think in terms of ecoregions, we'd fill a large gap if we protected the much greener Ruby Ranges ecoregion just east of the park. But I also realize Kalwani is not the best example when we're talking about protecting the stories that are tied to landscapes. It's not this way anymore, but for decades, First Nations people were barred from pr practicing their culture within the park, things like hunting and fishing. So the park severed ties to the land, it didn't protect them. And that's why it's so important to think in terms of protecting experiences and stories, not just the land. And so now most of our protected areas will be created through regional land use planning. After the Peel, the next one up is the Dawson region, which started but was put on hold. It has amazing wild places like the Tatondak River watershed. And before the plan was put on hold, five scenarios were developed for land use in the region. But only two of, the, er, two of these five didn't include a single new protected area. One of the reasons that happened was because protecting ecoregions and the diversity of our landscape was only a consideration, not a commitment. So one of the best things this park strategy could do is develop a commitment and a framework for ecoregion protection and link it to regional planning. And so to sum everything up, we have incredible wild places in the Yukon, but we can't expect they'll always be here. If we protect a significant portion of each ecoregion, it will help to protect the full range of wild places and the living things and the stories that they hold. Besides territorial parks, there's other ways to do this, things like habitat protection areas and indigenous protected areas. So my final suggestion is that it would be helpful to expand our thinking beyond just parks and commit to beginning a framework for conservation across the territory. And it's often said that to save wild species, you need to save wild spaces. And I would add that when we save the space, our spaces, we save the stories that are tied to a wild landscape. These are the stories of the Yukon, the stories we live every day, the stories our grandchildren will get to live every day, and the stories we carry in our heart. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, and well done on the 20 by 20. Actually, don't go away yet. I'm gonna ask if anyone in the audience has any questions for Randy. Any questions for Randy? Those are beautiful photos, by the way. 
in the back. I think that's that Mary. It is Mary. Oh, I just introduced yourself. Hi, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary, <laughs> as you know. Um, when you had that experience with the big flock of ptarmigan, um, that was a special experience, but were you aware that those ptarmigan could be hunted because of the co-management plan between the First Nations and the Tombstone Park? That they're not actually, you, you gave the impression that they were protected. Sure, well I think um, Yukon is a pretty different context than a lot of places in Canada. Um, and it, you know, hunting is um, more prominent here than in other places. Um, Personally, actually, when I was uh, in Tombstone, I actually was hunting. Um, and so, but when I put my CPAWS hat on, you know, as an organization, it's an issue that we're, we're neutral on. And I know there's, there's people in this room that support hunting, and there's people that do it all the time. There's people who are not so great, at, you know, who don't support it. But I think the one thing that we could probably all agree on is the importance of protecting these wild places. And we might differ a little bit on the nitty-gritty details, but I think... That's one thing we could all unite on. Thanks, Randy. And I appreciate the honest question and the honest response. And I think maybe the captain obvious is any planning exercises, hey, there's lots of perspectives in any, uh, in any community. And the key is how do we drill down to those key interests? You know, where do we find that, that alignment? So thanks for the question and the answer. So we're going to move along. Thanks again, Randy. We're going to move to, uh, to Dawn Reed. Don is with the Wildlife Conservation Society. I've lost his bio. Come on up, Don. I'll just grab this. Amy, I'll get you prepped. So Don, I don't believe this, but Don admits to being old-fashioned and getting old, but parks and their values are ageless, so don't mistake the message for the messenger. Over to you, Don. Thanks, John. That sounds pretty complicated, I guess, but the point of that introduction really is to... Uh, emphasize the fact that parks do get old, but they, are, they cannot be old-fashioned. They are so valuable to us around the world, and uh, we, we need to keep them in that light. Okay, thanks. So my message really here is to emphasize, as Stephen did to a large extent, the value of parks and protected areas for nature conservation. Uh, that is the main focus of my organization. Uh, these are, as Stephen mentioned, our most robust and valuable tool for conserving biodiversity. And they are a, a, a really important investment with huge returns. W uh, we, we've talked a little bit about the economic returns from, from uh, developing protected areas, but also the ecosystem services. But we have a growing need for parks in the Yukon, uh, as, a, as Randy pointed out, um, and Stephen. Uh, the Convention of Biological Diversity does uh, induce us to up the percentage of the land base that we have in protected areas. We have uh, targets for area to accomplish and uh, targets for ecosystem representation. Uh, I would challenge some who say the Yukon is still largely wilderness. The amount of mineral exploration advance claims as on this map is huge. The growing role of uh, off-road vehicles means that uh, we have um, precluded a lot of options for, for true conservation already on our land base. Uh, um, and so we really need to ask what can we accomplish as we move forward here. And I think we can accomplish a lot in the next few years and this Yukon Park strategy is a, uh, is a really excellent first place to start. Um, first we need to get more ecosystems covered. Um, both Christy and Randy showed the map with the large portions of central and southeast Yukon without any real representation yet in our system. And we particularly need low elevations in our parks. We've got too much high elevation stuff. Uh, well, I wouldn't say too much, but a very high proportion, uh, Kluani being the example that's being used already. Uh, we need to plan for climate change in the system. That map shows from blue where there essentially is no projected climate change uh, for the next 70 years to red where there's huge amount of change. And it shows some potential in, in the southeast and south Yukon for real value in protected areas where there are refugial habitats. Uh, we really need to aim for indigenous protected areas. Um, Darius really pointed out the, the value of land use planning in achieving that with the First Nations vision. And I think the Peel is another example. And we have other land use plans where the First Nations vision for in indigenous protected areas can really come to fruition. And Pathway to Target One 
the, the Canadian federal government is already headed down that path. And that's really all I had to say. I wanted to make this a short one. I've only got nine slides, so I didn't actually realize I only had 20 seconds per slide, but um, that's really got my message across. Thanks very much, and it really uh, it, it reiterates some of the things Stephen and Randy pointed out. So thanks very much. Thanks, Don. Oh, don't go anywhere. You just bought us time for lots of questions. So, who has a question for Don? I have a, no, Mary has a question for Don. Hi, how would you keep uh, off-road vehicles off the land? Uh, uh, off the land that has not already been degraded by them. Excellent, excellent question, Mary, and, and it's, it's part of a, a large set of policy uh, discussions going on now, and fortunately this current uh, territorial government is, is keen to address that issue and to address some of the concerns of the ENGOs that have been brought forward to this government. Um, it's going to take some very um, forward-thinking efforts at a land use planning uh, table to begin with to actually zone some areas as off off limits to off-road vehicles, um, and it's going to take um, uh, the the vision of limiting off-road vehicles to certain existing trails, and avoiding and putting out out of bounds certain habitats like alpine and wetland areas. So there's a mix of strategies, but I think the the critical part about it all is that it's going to take some real strong political vision and um, concerted effort from people who are participating in land use planning, basically, to, to try and get this, this kind, those, some of those initiatives off the ground. So that's a preliminary answer, but uh, it, it's encouraging that territory-wide, uh, the, the issue is really being discussed quite deeply. I have a question for Don, unless there is a question in the back. Don, nice presentation. My name's Linda. Hello. I'm a hunter, and so I travel all those trails. And um, how are you going to manage keeping the right division between hunters and land use management? The Yukon government closed our trails with the yellow gates to all the gravel pits and all the other hunting roads. The First Nations closed our hunting paths on other roads. So you've got a lot of hunters that really don't have a lot of places to go any longer. How are you going to actually be able to implement and sell them more land in a zone that we can't get to? Just as I bring the, the mic to Dawn, just for clarification, so Dawn doesn't work for Yukon government? Uh, I think it's still a decent question. It's a good question. So over to you, Don. Yeah, it's a tough question, I, I admit. Um, uh, although I, I don't fully understand it in terms of the, the closures. I mean, there, there may well be uh, individual First Nations and individual trails that you, uh, not trails, but uh, road access to gravel pits that Yukon government has closed for various reasons. I, I, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily to keep the hunters out. It may be in the, in the First Nations instance if it's, if it's their own settlement land. But um, the, the, the promotion of protected areas does not necessarily preclude hunting. And, and so, I mean, the main point that I'm trying to put across here is that um, we do need more protected habitat for, for wildlife um, across the territory. And in fact, I believe that protecting uh, large areas in a, in a full-fledged wilderness situation without off-road vehicles in them actually provides a source of uh, big game that can then move out of those protected areas, uh, which would be close to carrying capacity for those game species, uh, which would then uh, help populate uh, s uh, and, and replenish some of the areas that are, that are being hunted. 
Um, I, I'm certainly not anti-hunting by any means, um, and I, but I do recognize that when access is easy, game populations decline, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure most hunters can see that happening too when new areas get opened up. So that, that's a partial answer I understand to, to, to your concern overall, and we could talk about it separately if you want. Thank you, Don, and thank you for the question. And just as I mentioned in the beginning, there's some big important questions. Some of them we're asking, some of them we've asked in the discussion document, and no doubt there will be more. And the point of this strategy is to really sort of figure out the questions that we need to be asking and figure out answers to those, to the best of our ability to sort of meet those interests. So thank you, Don. So we're now going to move to two back-to-back -back presentations from the final two fo uh, folks from Parks. So first up, we have Carrie. And Carrie's here. No, have I got that right? Is Carrie going first? Carrie, did you want to go first? I think right. that's what we have you down for. Um, so Carrie uh, Muro and then Barry are both going to do part one, part two of So You Want to Visit Yukon Parks. Carrie's going to kick us off with the operational realities, what it takes to manage the large parks, including the backcountry experience. And I'm just going to quickly read. So, Carrie has worked for parks organizations for her entire career, and her favorite experience was walking up on Hers pardon me, waking up on Herschel Island and walking out the front door of the traveler's cabin and almost bumping into a muskox in the morning fog. Later the same day, the world, the largest private residential cruise ship, arrived for a shore visit. What a contrast. Over to you, Carrie. Thanks, John. Your timer? Yeah. Okay, we're on it. <coughs> so you want to visit Yukon Parks. So does Sam. Sam's a Herschel Park Ranger and a new Vialowit citizen who works seasonally on the island. Right now, he's been waiting five extra days to get in for his shift. The weather and the Arctic Ocean environment make access an ongoing issue for park operations. So do parks maintenance staff. What does it take to build, maintain a facility in the fly-in only region of Ni Inli Nijik Territorial Park, Fishing Branch, slinging in building materials with a helicopter and construction in the remote wilderness, far from resources? So does Alice, a Tombstone Park Ranger. She's tasked with the environmental protection, public safety, trail building and maintenance and regulation, compliance, and enforcement, as well as the ever popular slinging outhouse barrels out from the back country with a helicopter. So do commercial operators, such as the Klondike Experience, a local operator based in Dawson, who's required to apply for a park permit, as well as book their back country trip on an online registration system created to manage use in Tombstone Territorial Parks Recreation Zone. So do cruise ships. Since the opening of the Northwest Passage, cruise ships have appeared in the Arctic Ocean. Herschel Island Kikiktarik Territorial Park is a popular day visit for visitors, docking offshore and zodiacing in groups to and from the island. So do wildlife viewing operations, such as Bear Cave Eco Adventures. A commercial joint venture between the operator and the Von Tukwichin Development Corporation. The high concentration of salmon and resultant grizzly bear congregation provide a special ecotourism viewing opportunity. So do the First Nations in the Yukon, such as the Trondic Wachin, who are staying connected to their traditional territory by collaborat collaboratively managing through the Tombstone Park Management Committee and ensuring employment and economic opportunities and the continued use and care for these special places. So, yikes. so does Lori Ann, sorry, from Aklavik, an Anuvialuit citizen, um, returning to Kikiktarik and engaging in traditional activities as a priority for the people of the Anuvialuit settlement region. So do muskox. Herschel Island Kikiktarik is their home, 
During the winter months, he travels um, over the ice to and from the mainland, but a number remain on the island after the ice goes out wandering to and from Pauline Cove and the wilderness zone. So do ice grizzlies. The Fishing Branch River remains open late into the fall and the warm waters allow an October chum salmon run. These grizzlies feast on the salmon in preparation for the winter in the nearby caves of Bear Cave Mountain. So do enthusiasts of all kind, such as birders. Yukon Wilderness Parks are home to many rare species. The surf bird makes its home in the small region of Tombstone Territorial Park and is just one example of the many species that can be found there. So does the Premier. The Honourable Sandy Silver also visits Yukon Parks, most recently visiting Herschel Island Kiki Tarak in September of 2017. Coast to Coast to Coast, or Canada C3, uh, Canada 150 initiative brought people from all over the country to the island. So do paddlers, rafters, and canoeists. Many wilderness parks throughout our system provide ample opportunities for recreational activities on Yukon's waterways. So do outfitters, hunters, trappers, and fishermen. Popular recreational and subsistence harvesting activities often continue once a park has been created. Cooperation and coordination between different departments and branches of the government is required. So do campers and park visitors, such as the 23,000 visitors to Tombstone Interpretive Center in 2017. Many interpretive programs are offered throughout the season at this center, including backcountry orientations, wildlife viewing opportunities, interpretive hikes, and cultural programming. So do researchers, such as Ug Landwitt from the Alfred Wagner Institute of Germany. He and his research team come up annually to Herschel Island Kikiktar to research and monitor permafrost conditions in this sensitive and ever-changing environment. So do wildlife photographers like Peter Mather, Ni Inli Nijik, and the commercial bear viewing, viewing operator draw and guide professional wildlife photographers from around the world to capture images of these unique grizzlies in their environment. So do amateur photographers such as this, um, such as Lolita. On her bucket list is to capture the iconic images of Tombstone Territorial Park's mountain ranges and fall colors. These enthusiasts can only access these ranges by air or on foot. All these users and clients of Yukon's wilderness parks have different motivations for visiting and differing needs from our organization. Many activities in the implemented parks require park use permits, and you can see here the permit numbers are also on the rise. Do you want to visit Yukon parks? Tell us what you want and need for this system in the coming years. I was going to. Thank you, Carrie. So, as I mentioned, we're going to grab the whole uh, Yukon Parks team up here in a second. Uh, but before we do, we need Barry Troke. There's Barry. So, as Barry comes down, uh, Barry is going to contrast Carrie from an operational perspective and speak about the front country. So, as Amy gets uh, loaded, I'll just tell you a little about Barry. So, Barry has worked for Canada's most northerly national park. That would be, who knows? Apparently, it is Quitin near. I think that's it. There we go, nailed it. Um, national park located on the tip of Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic. He began his exciting career in resource management with Parks Canada in 96. And he's worked as a park warden, supervisor, manager for Canada's large northern parks, including Iowetuk. Nahani, Chilkoot, Von Tut National Park. And since then, Barry has done a complete 180 from managing big, beautiful backcountry parks to managing Yukon's relatively small, but still beautiful front country campgrounds. Here's a fun fact about Barry. I have crashed in a twit otter twice, actually, on the shores of northern Ellesmere Island and sank in a jet boat on the waves of the southern Nahani River. I've walked through the herds of Arctic hares and had an Arctic wolf take a ball cap off my head. Life seems simpler now. Over to you, Barry. All right. Thank you. Thing, you say go? 
All right, so you want to visit, uh, you're going camping. You're at your favorite campground, Wolf Creek, could be Million Dollar Falls, uh, Pine Lake. Uh, a lot of things happen when you go to these places. You got a, you got a fire pit, you got uh, outhouses, you got a wood box that's full. I'm going to take you behind the scenes and tell you how that works. That's me on the left. And these are all the smart people that do all the hard work. What this is, is there are a lot of moving parts to this program. You got to understand that. We're big and there's a lot of moving parts. And this, I'm going to tell you about the workshop, the maintenance crew, and the park officers. But first, step back in time. It started as a system of roadside uh, campsites in the 1940s by the Forest Service. It wasn't until the 70s, that's when they were building the Alaska Highway. In the 70s, they for the government formalized it into campgrounds and recreation sites. So that was our humble beginnings almost 50 years ago. By the numbers today, we have 42 roadside campgrounds, 11 recreation sites, over 1,000 campsites, hundreds of wood boxes, outhouses, garbage cans, boat launches, hiking trails, 600 plus signs, and we put out over 15,000 rolls of toilet paper every season. Uh-oh. So here's what we're not. We're not a private campground. They offer you electric services, a dump station, Wi-Fi, and that's great. It's good for the economy. I encourage you to use them. But we are more rustic outhouses, backcountry. Even though we're rustic, 84% in 2016, we're either satisfied or very satisfied with our service. By the numbers, in 2017, we provided over 57,000 nights uh, of camping for 82,000 people. Uh, we're experienced a 123% increase over the last 11 years. That's painful. Campsite occupancy is growing at approximately 12% per year. About twice as many tourists use our campgrounds compared to Yukoners, and approximately one quarter of Yukoners do camp in our campgrounds each year. So we are, we are uh, very important to the local economy and certainly to the tourism industry. Look at that graph, how we're climbing. Okay, I told you I'd tell you about how it works behind the scenes. Uh, so what we have in the workshop downtown Whitehorse, we have two full-time staff and one seasonal, and they build all the facilities that make your life great when you go to the campgrounds. Signs, outhouses, kitchen shelters, uh, picnic tables, they make it all. It all has to be maintained. We have zero full-time maintenance staff, but we have 22 seasonal maintenance staff that go out there and take care of this stuff. Uh, fixing trails, fixing everything you see and use, installing outhouse tanks, emptying the garbage cans, cleaning the outhouses. They do an awesome job. This is a shout out to them. You can't talk about parks without talking about firewood. Okay, it's going to come up. It's, um, it's, it's a positive and a negative, right? The positive is it's one of the things tourists love and people like. Um, and it's good for local uh, contractors. The negative is it costs a lot of money. Park officer program. These rats on the right brought it into establishment in 2004. We have one full-time uh, park officer and six seasonals. Uh, and they were to deal with the drunkenness, the rowdiness. Our campgrounds got away on us. They deal with over 500 incidents a season is what they respond to. The program is built on education, compliance, and enforcement. In the beginning, there were nine arrests. There was assault against peace officers. It was, it was really rough. Now we don't have that anymore. We're on the compliance side, and that's because they make over 20,000 contacts with the public each summer. This is so you know what it takes to run this 42 campgrounds. We are all over the territory from Watson Lake, Beaver Creek, you know, past Eagle Plains. When these programs go on the road, they're covering a lot of ground. It's, it's a big operation, a lot of moving parts. And that's Paul. Uh, we have aging infrastructure. Remember I said it started in the 70s? Well, all that's caught up to us now. Nothing lasts the test of time. We have garbage cans that no longer are safe. We have boat launches that are failing throughout the territory. We have docks and walkways and things that are causing us trouble. Even our fire pits are rusting at the bottom. We're trying to keep up. The government today, though, in 2018, we're investing an additional 720000 to improve the facilities, outhouse tanks, new uh, recycling bins, new accessible picnic tables. 
And accessibility is a new part and a big part of our program. Everything we build new going forward, we think about accessibility. So tell us what you think. I told you about yesterday. I talked about today. We need your information for tomorrow. Pay attention to these different ways. You can give us your comments. And I am the comments department, it feels like, at Parks. I get it all, the good and the bad. Anyway, we want to know what you think. Uh, this is just time to relax. I'm nervous, and now I can breathe. But this is what parks, even campgrounds, recreation sites, and those big wilderness, those big beautiful wilderness parks, this is what they are meant to make us feel like. It's, it's healthy, it's good to be outside. So thank you, and there it is, Jean, engageyukon.ca for you. Thanks, Barry. So Barry, don't go anywhere if you can grab a seat on the stage. I need Jean, I need Carrie, and Christy. So here's how this is gonna work, guys. The firing line, I'm joking, it's not a firing line. But we wanna create some space to ask some questions. Now here's the thing, I'm trying to, to balance this opportunity to talk to folks here with my commitment to get you at the door by nine o'clock. We have lost presenters, so we actually have gained some time. So don't worry to our three next presenters, which are in tourism, stick around for those. If I don't get your question now, we are here after nine o'clock, we've got our discussion stations, we're here and we're happy to continue those conversations. So I see Mary's got a hand up. I just want to give a chance to, to anyone who's not asked a question. Has anyone not asked a question? Okay, I'm gonna go to the back, then here, and then I got Mary. Sure, I'm gonna do my best. We'll go to the back here. So again, your name and the question. Hi, my name's Tara, and I uh, was wanting to ask the gentleman who just presented, sorry. Barry. Barry. Um, I'd like to know, um, as a Yukoner, and I drive by the campgrounds quite a bit. I'd like to know what you're going to do about the garbage. Um, there's times where, where I drive by and yes, it's a seasonal thing and I know um, there's nothing worse than s driving by and there is so much um, garbage and the garbage bin is locked. And I know you um, campground places and parks are trying to limit the amount of garbage that tourism is trying to kind of stamp on, but um, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I just, as a Yukoner, I've had, drove by a couple places, and I'm, I'm really disturbed by the amount of garbage around the garbage bins. Thanks for the question. So I'll pass it to Barry about garbage. Garbage, favorite subject after outhouses. Uh, no, that's a, that's a, I can validate that concern. It's definitely a concern of ours as well. It's, it's uh, happening throughout the territory. That, it almost speaks to that 12% increase that we're seeing in traffic. So we are doing our best to try and keep up, certainly when we receive a complaint. Like from the, we're, we're more of a reactive, unfortunately, a reactive operation right now. So I, you know, we get a complaint. We uh, certainly work with the conservation officers, or in some cases, it's a contractor who's taking care of it, or our own employees. And we're all over it to try and resolve it. So do I have an answer? No. Um, is it a resourcing issue? Maybe. Is it, maybe we need to rethink how we do garbage in the Yukon. You know, maybe we need uh, something from the public or somebody else out there who has something innovative for us. Um, and an example is we're going to pilot project something at Yukon Parks, hopefully. It's a different kind of system, okay? Uh, it's a giant garbage can that you sink in the ground about 10 feet rather than being s on the surface. And it attracts bears, let's say, for smells. This garbage can is down in a cool environment, um, so it emits less um, odors. Um, it only has to be changed, so it's more efficient, potentially, and this is about innovation. This may not work, but we're trying stuff, right? So uh, less visits by the park attendant, so the park attendant could spend more time picking up garbage around the area. So. Do I have an answer or a solution? No, I don't. Are we willing to try stuff? Absolutely. So I guess that's what I got for you. And just so everybody knows, you have the entire branch management team here in front of you. So if we don't have it, then we just don't have it. Thanks, Barry. That reminds me of some of the waste management systems in Algonquin Park where they're sunk into the ground. Um, actually, there's a question up here, and then I'll go to the back. Uh, for the lady in the striped shirt, sorry, I forget the name, um, Carly. Yeah, sorry, my name's Carly. Um, just in regards to Herschel, and you mentioned the cruise ships, obviously we have these great parks to 
um, you know, like promote biodiversity and protection of the land. So where is kind of the line for how many people we're letting in? And um, talked about fishing branch earlier, like it's very remote, it's very fly-in, but what's to say the future is not going to allow people in there? Um, just kind of what's the boundary for that there? Thanks for the question. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, we talk a lot about the green, putting a green blob on a map, a park or a protected area will draw people to it. How do you, um, how do you put a number on how much is too much? How do you manage uh, the use of that area and the different uses? All good questions, all important questions to work on. The, the short answer is through a park management plan. Um, the Herschel Island Territorial Park Management Plan review process is just ending and we've given a lot of thought to cruise ship and um, the traffic it, it brings, the impacts to the island and how we're going to manage that going forward. So that's the short answer, but there's, there's again, it's not a easy, p you know, pick a number um, type of answer. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, management pro um, question that we have with all of our management plans when we work with our first with First Nations partners um, there is no as Carrie said there is no magic number it's different for different sites there's different for different parks um, and it's a uh, we're continually evolving and how um, that issue can be managed um, in the future okay there was a hand in the back but I want to go here, and then I'll go to the back, and then we're going to move on. And remind us your name. Thank you. My name is Dave. I understand that there's going to be a strategy for parks management. But I just want to know, what are the overarching objective for the strategy that is going to drive the strategy? Is it conservation, commercial, economic? Just need to know what are your overarching objective for the strategy itself. Great question about objectives. I'm going straight to Jean. That is a great question. And um, to get to the answer that I will pr give you is to go back to the point that we are at the very front end of the process. And we are looking for input at the very front end of the process before we have set things like that. And again, I know that some people love that, some people don't. So if you're the people who like to have a draft to respond to, stay with us, we'll get to that. So um, uh, so there is no draft and you know there's no secret draft you know in the back pocket that comes out. Um, so we really are having this conversation at the front end. So having said that, um, you know the legislation does provide the, the founding direction for what our parks are supposed to accomplish. That, that was one of the slides. Um, and it is, um, it, it, every parks agency deals with the fact that we have that spectrum of protection and use. And if we do, if you picked either end of that spectrum and said that's what we're doing, we would be failing as a parks agency. So the, the challenge of the strategy is how to excel at all of it. Um, and that's my objective for the strategy. Thank you. And final question. And again, folks, if we didn't get all the questions, we're here after 9 o'clock. We can have more intimate conversations afterwards. And again, as John said, this is just the beginning of this conversation. Final question. That's Linda again. To any of you who can answer this, are, are you projecting to expand the current campgrounds as a protected area? Or are you looking to do multiple bigger areas or you know, just kind of have you got a plan of where you're targeting more ground to protect? As I bring it, just to clarify, so this sounds like an expansion. Is it both of parks and campgrounds or one or parks and campgrounds? Is there going to be more space? Okay. Whoops. There's the line. Who am I going to? Christy. Um, at least on the big wilderness park side, 
Um, no, we don't have a, a, a crystal ball to look into see what um, Yukoners or First Nation partners would think of in terms of land use planning overall into the future to fill in the gaps that we've got right now. We don't have that, um, but that is the current system is to plan those out through the planning of um, implementation of final agreements and through land use planning um, overall. So we have an idea of, we know eco-regions and we know um, where we're lacking and where we are doing okay, um, but no, we don't have a map that actually says blobs. That this is where we want to go in the future. We're not there yet. And I think it's mainly we're not there yet because of the system that um, uh, land use planning and, f and final agreements goes on um, within the Yukon overall. Okay, I'll uh, speak to campgrounds. Uh, do we have a master plan? No, we don't. And I think that's part of this conversation. Do Yukoners want more campgrounds? Do they want less? Do they want different kinds of campgrounds? Um, our last campground we built, we hadn't built a campground in over 30 years, and then working with the First Nation, uh, Karkaros Tagish, we built Conrad Campground. It was a huge success, it's a great campground. It barely made an impact in our system in terms of our 12% growth per year. Uh, so we're, we're still at capacity that way. Um, we do have a plan to do some infill. So we are taking some of our campgrounds that exist and we're, look, we're trying to find opportunity to add some campsites to those uh, campgrounds to relieve pressure. Uh, we don't have those all mapped out. We don't know exactly where that is. Um, that's that's part of the process over the next couple of years. But I think it's this is the conversation, as Jean said, this is the start of it. We need to know if that's what Yukoners and tourists, uh, visitors to the Yukon, want. Um, we can make all kinds of decisions, but you know we can't see the forest for the trees. That 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 old adage. Is it's real. We live in it, so we need to know what Yukoners want, what level of service they want, what their expectations are. So that's the conversation about campgrounds. I was kind of echo um, Barry on the larger wilderness park side. If you want it to go differently, <laughs> this is your opportunity to say it. Um, so yeah, it's tell us what you want, and then we can help help make decisions moving forward. Okay, I actually, I'm gonna apologize guys. I'm gonna keep us moving because I wanna commit to my nine o'clock. If you have other questions, come talk to us after nine o'clock. So thank you to our Yukon Parks team. <clears throat> I do mean that if you're able to stick around, come talk to us or be part of the process moving forward. Guys, we're gonna move into tourism. And if you didn't know, tourism has a really important roots in the parks movement. Um, so we've got three back-to-back -back presentations. Um, that I think are an important part of this conversation. So to kick us off, we've got Carlene Kerr. Where's Carlene? There's Carlene. So Carlene, um, come on down. And here is the slideshow. And I'm just gonna tell you a quick thing about Carlene. So Carlene is a communications analyst with the Department of Tourism and Culture and a new but passionate Yukoner. And she's actually shared with us her six word story. And it goes like this, came for work, staying for adventure. Carlene, over to you. All right, so I just wanted to, cool. yeah, I guess that helps. <laughs> um, so I appreciate the opportunity to join with you all tonight because tourism, culture, and parks really all go hand in hand. Um, Yukon is wild, explore with me. Unlike no other, wild adventures, lasting memories, nowhere land. Find your true nature. Wireless detox, free with every visit. These are just some of the amazing six word stories that Yukoners created as part of the Yukon Tourism Development Strategy public engagement process. Similar to Talking Yukon Parks, the Department of Tourism and Culture, supported by industry stakeholders, recognized an opportunity to come together and develop a vision and strategy for the sector. Uh, instead of go government going out and just drafting a strategy, uh, the department held its largest ever public engagement to help inform th the content and also to ensure that what the strategy entailed uh, was representative of Yukoners' perspectives. So our task was to speak with uh, as many people as possible to, to hear their thoughts on how to sustainably grow tourism in the territory. In just over the last two months, 
55 engagement sessions were held. This includes uh, meeting engagement sessions with Yukon First Nations, municipalities, uh, arts and culture, uh, tourism industry stakeholders, uh, Parks Canada, Yukon government, and the public. Uh, in total, 115 surveys were completed online, 10 written submissions were received, uh, which all in all means that we received over 9,200 comments. So with the engagement period now closed, uh, the department's now in the process of analyzing all of the data uh, and determining where there is alignment and opportunities for collaboration. Um, this work is being guided by a steering committee made up of 15 inspiring individuals who represent a wide range of interests uh, from municipalities, First Nation governments, development corporations, arts and culture, and the tourism industry experts. Uh, we're also working internally within YG to find ways that we can work better together, and Yukon Parks is at the table. Um, our goal with the guidance and direction of the steering committee is to develop a high-level strategy that all Yukoners can see themselves in. Uh, so that works underway, and we hope to release a draft strategy for public comment uh, later in the year. So what does this mean for campgrounds? Um, my home on display for the world. Another great six-word story. Uh, Travel Yukon's key markets, our key target markets, include cultural explorers and authentic experiencers. So these visitors are known to want to get off the beaten track. Uh, they want to, they understand natural and uh, cultural environments, and they tend to want to stay away from big groups and do their own thing. Through targeting these explorers, we know that tourists love our campgrounds and protected areas and the natural beauty that we have here in Yukon. Uh, so non-resident campsite nights were 10% higher in 2017 over 2016, and that's almost 40% higher uh, than the five-year average. And we know also know that non-resident campsite nights have grown an average of 5% per year. Uh, so it's not surprising that as part of the tourism engagement, we heard a lot about Yukon parks, national parks, protected areas, and uh, what really makes Yukon so special. So sense of pride, love my Yukon, the Yukon, a great place to hide, beyond ordinary, dangerous, wild. Yukoners are passionate about the outdoors, and we heard a lot of great ideas through our engagement. Um, we heard a lot of ideas about new wilderness tourism experiences and how they can support the tourism industry. We also heard a lot about fears of over-tourism and how that negatively impacts, or how that can have a negative impact on the land. Um, we heard about the need to respect the land, to keep it clean and pristine. We heard about the importance of working together and developing new and innovative partnerships. We heard about the need to support programs and interpretation in our parks to help Yukon's values and heritage be shared with visitors and locals alike. We even heard really cool ideas like creating a parks coupon book so that visitors don't have to have cash when they're in the communities. Um, but at the end of the day, what was really clear is that Yukoners are proud of where we live and want to make sure that it's preserved for generations to come. So it's really great that both the Department of Tourism and Culture and Yukon Parks are, are engaging with Yukoners to hear what that future looks like. So I'll end with just three last six word stories. Wild history in the making. Enjoy the wilderness, keep it clean. So much land, so little time. And I'm early. <laughs> Thank you, Carlene, and uh, great job on the six word stories. Does anyone have any questions for Carlene? I see a question there. And if you can just remind us your name. Hi, my name is Liz. Um, so looking at the amount of information that you've collected for campgrounds, et cetera, um, I know that a lot of this information, or most of it, is collected from, um, from Yukoners. I'm wondering if there has been any input or any opportunity for input from outside groups, like, say, tourists, uh, American tourists, European tourists, that sort of thing. I'm just wondering if you've given others the, the opportunity to have some input into this. Great question. What is the role of our visitors in this process? Carlene. Thank you. So... Um, we did reach out to a number of um, our marketing department, we reached out to a number of our uh, tourism counterparts. Um, so in Alaska, in um, BC, in other jurisdictions, and overseas to see what they had to say, um, given you know they want to send people 
they want people to come and explore the Yukon as well. We're also actually in the process of our visitor exit survey. So you might see people or workers and staff out on the roadsides and at our point of entries and in our airports. Um, and what they're doing is they're asking visitors exactly what they did here. You know, what did you like? What did you wish you would have had? What was your experience? What do you wish there was more of? Um, we do that about every five years to get all the data that we need to help inform decision making. Um, so that just started, I believe, it's a year process, so I think it ends in November of this year. And then we take a lot of time to review all that data. Um, and then we provide reports and information to the industry and, and people who need it to help make their decisions. And then lastly, as part of the strategy, we're also looking at um, best practice practices and jurisdictional analysis of what tourism, what's working and what doesn't work in tourism and other jurisdictions. And all that's going to feed in into the strategy. Good question. Good answer. And I just want to check. I believe you referenced that tourism is not doing this alone. They're working with Yukon Parks or Yukon with other parts of government. And I think I heard that Parks this summer is going to go and talk to people in campgrounds and parks and it'll be working with tourism. So the left hand does talk to the right hand. Okay. Thanks, Carlene. So we've got two more folks, two more from the tourism perspective, which is a really important part of this. Where's, there's Jill. Come on down, Jill Pangman. Jill, we're going to get your slideshow uh, up and running, and I'm going to quickly read this. So Jill was working in the summer of 1974 for Waterton Park-based nature writer and photographer Andy Russell. A warden friend of his from Kluwani called up the offer to fly him into Tweedsmere in Northern BC, an hour flight from Haynes Junction to photograph the surging or galloping glacier. It was crashing to a mountain on the east side of the Alsek River and trying to dam that powerful river in the process. Jill and Andy flew up from Alberta with still a movie uh, cameras, spent several days perched on the side of the river um, to watch it all happen. The introductory foray into the wilds of northern BC and southern Yukon hooked her. And now, four decades later, exploring the wild recess of the territory has her still passionate. And here she is, Jill Pangman. Thank you. Maybe while that first slide comes up, and if you could just leave that one on. I just want to do a little preamble, and then we'll Sorry, move. We yeah, yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hopefully before the end of this. <laughs> um, so I came up to the Yukon for work, just like our last speaker, and ended up um, staying in the north and coming back over the summers and continuing to stay because I was so mesmerized by the wild landscape of this place and growing up in eastern Canada and seeing the impact that population and industry has on landscape, um, I decided this is where I wanted to be and I understand why people travel from all over the world to come to this country, to come to this place. Uh, to me, the Yukon has a lot of fairly untrammeled landscape and as we talked about earlier, You're going to see an image of him perched above Duo Lakes and his legacy will hold in the Peel watershed. And he of many others have been involved with this, but Yuri was the one that started the visionary and the tenacity to, to uh, try and work towards protection there. We'll just see where we're going. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Fantastic. Give me a countdown, starting at 10. Okay, there we go. So there's Yuri and Sarah yeah, looking over Duo Lake. So that's the iconic image, one of the iconic images of the Peel watershed right there. 
And so I just wanted to have a, I have a few images here, and of course it was hard to select just 20, so there's many that aren't included, but just some of the, some of the reasons that people come. I've been involved with wilderness tourism for the last 30 years in the Yukon, and um, I've seen what has drawn people uh, to the north. And there's many reasons, and one of it, a big one is wild intact landscapes. Um, so if we can just move on. Uh, and the different activities. So one of the ways into some of the, the arteries through these many times, and this is uh, I'm just, there's gonna be a few from the Peel watershed here as we go forward. This is the uh, Hart River here, going down through some of the canyons. And so obviously there's the silence and the peace of it and the clean water and the incredibly beautiful landscapes. This is actually a mineral lake over on the far right side. It's on the Wind River and people come for wildlife and to have the experience of, and not always necessarily seeing it, but at least being able to see the sign of it. And this is a very uh, prolific mineral lake along these uh, ponds and right on this area in the, t in the top right. Um, Obviously, wildlife along the river, some species like this need a lot of uh, space to survive in, and they travel uh, many, as we know, long, long distances. And some, um, we need large landscapes like this to be able to support populations of animals that need to travel a long way. Okay. And others that are more local, and always an incredible treat for people to see in the actual the wildlife in close up and it can be some of the most memorable experiences that they take away with them. This is a guide in training <laughs> at six years old <laughs> on the Wind River. And um, Okay, so that was a few from the Peel Watershed, which is not yet a so-called protected area, but it's a wild landscape that has increasing potential threats to it if it isn't protected. Uh, just a few other imagery of other parks in the Yukon, this is a Vavik National Park, and one of the ways to access some of these areas is by plane. They are remote, and as a result of that, there's not that many people that travel into some of this country, but the people that do travel there have phenomenal experiences. Okay, and this is rafting down the, one of the rapids of the Firth River. So sometimes it's the thrills and spills, and uh, usually it's just a way to get through a piece of country and to enjoy the, the, uh, the activity itself. Um, and uh, but it's the overall experience that people take away with them of being in a piece of country like this. Okay. And this uh, other there's other <laughs> besides the hiking and the the boating. Um, this is actually a, a, a an old whale bone they figured, and for years we were walking on just the very head of this that you can see at the top end of it, and we thought it was um, when we first found it up on a caribou trail up off of the Firth River, we thought it was the leg bone of a mammoth. And it wasn't until we actually dug it out of the ground that we found out and we brought it, we sent pictures, brought down pictures to the archeologist here and he said, no, that's probably a whale, uh, the scapula of a whale. <laughs> but anyway, this can also be very interesting for people finding uh, tools that have been left behind from, that weren't uh, ratted, this was not glaciated, this landscape. And so you can find sometimes uh, implements that were left behind by many generations ago and also some Pleistocene animals, which we thought this was, but it turns out it wasn't, but it was probably quite old. And just a, a scene, a camp scene from, from the Firth River in the Vavik National Park. And, and uh, creative, uh, people come for creative pursuits, for photography, uh, painting, art. Here there's a lesson going on here of, of uh, <laughs> how to do a painting and how to get the process. That's Joyce Majiski. So sometimes people coming from outside of the territory for tours and also local people being infused. And Joyce is a prolific artist here in the Yukon and her art has been, much of it has been very influenced by her experiences in the Yukon wilds. And Corey Trepani are a phenomenal landscape artist that's done work right across the northern national parks of the country. Um, this is a trip on the Alsek River, and he does his paintings right up on site. And then this was turned into a 12-foot long, huge landscape painting when he was back in the studio. The wind here was blowing at about 50 knots, <laughs> so it was quite a... And uh, so there's the Alsek River, another protected area, Kalwani National Park. And uh, my own story for the Yukon started only a couple of day days paddle downstream from here at Turnback Canyon, where that Tweedsmere Glacier was trying to dam the Alsek River. 
and many years later guiding trips down the river. And uh, so people come for the, it, it, it's not just a landscape, this, this is a, an incredibly spectacular landscape and something very foreign to most people that would come there to actually be able to paddle amongst icebergs and to look up into the largest non-polar ice field on the planet. Mountain goats, you know, there were areas like we showed before with animals that are moving through the landscape. Here's an area called Goat Herd Mountain where people that come to here, visitors, will expect to see goats if they go up on the mountain. Another part of Kluane National Park with Mount Logan behind, uh, ski trips. So it's another way that people access the wild country by going up onto the ice fields. And as I mentioned, this is the largest non-polar ice field on the planet. And, and uh, not that many people go into here, but those that do, again, have a phenomenal experience, both ski touring and mountain climbing. In Kosovo National Park, just on the other side of Primrose Lake, um, hiking. And Tombstone. And I remember having a um, Japanese tourist with me, not this person here, but on the, just up on this ridge, just above here. And uh, I pointed across to the west, or to the east, and I said, there's no, if we went from here to the Atlantic Ocean, we wouldn't hit a single road. You know, of course, there might be one up to a mine site, in a mine, if it happened to cross it, but looking at a trajectory out of a map, and she was just completely blown away by that. And there's the iconic, actually you can't see Tombstone itself because it's in the background there in the cloud, but just the sort of one of the iconic scenes from, from uh, our territorial parks in the Yukon, Tombstone. Yeah, so that was, yep. Yeah, of course I had hundreds more, hundreds more slides looking at with stories for each one about different aspects of tourism, but this was just a little snapshot of some of the reasons people come up here. Thanks, Jill, for uh, being here on behalf of the uh, Wilderness Tourism, Tourism Association of Yukon. And you mentioned a lot of photos. There was a quest in the back from someone visiting the Yukon who wants photos. You guys should talk. There you go. Connections are made. Does anyone have any questions for Jill before we move to our final presenter? Any questions for Jill? <laughs> Mission accomplished. Okay, let's pull up our final presenter, Tina Dixon. Come on down. So uh, Amy is going to get your presentation ready. I'm just going to read a bit about Tina. So Who, What, Where Tours was created by a true Yukon ambassador, Tina Dixon. In this day and age, we would say Tina's lead role is definitely a pioneer in her unique, wise way. Tina saw a real need to offer more authentic Yukon experiences led by Yukoners, which would be affordable for travelers of all ages. How are we promoting Yukon as a world-class destination if we are going to continue to market ourselves and our products with visitors saying the North is too expensive to visit? We lived that growing up, and it is time to make it affordable for a visitor. So Tina's always found time to actively volunteer in our community, and she's a solid understanding of why the North is such a great place to live. Tina and her family live a very active lifestyle with their outfitting company. The outfitting industry is one of the first tourism experiences people traveled to the Yukon for back in the early 1900s. Their company, Dixon Outfitters Limited, has been operating for over 100 years in the Yukon. Tourism is changing and it is important to our territory. Tina believes her understanding of community needs and the balance of what we have to offer will assist with a continued interest to further develop the territory in a responsible manner, making it a truly first-class destination with universal promotion to a number of diverse markets. Tina, thank you for joining us this evening. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for uh, holding out till 9 o'clock. Hopefully it's still sunny out. Um, I'm actually kind of glad that industry got to go last. Um, we're the creative, we're the thinkers outside the box, we're the business, we're the innovators. And so when government and parks got to present first, it kind of gives a, a bit of a framework because that's how they're managed and, and told to think. So uh, I am so glad that industry is here today. Um, I have a couple slides uh, just representing some of the areas and what we do, but also thinking um, from past to future, business in our backyard. And of course, um, Kluwani is one of our, our main areas. Uh, and we end up having a lot of day tour experiences. Our visitor is changing. They're wanting to go experience a little bit faster um, areas that might not be as accessible. And how we do that is very important with uh, offering it in a safe manner, as well as making sure that um, we leave a light footprint, and it's our responsibility 
as a tour operator, as well as my daughter here, who is a Kalani First Nation in her traditional territory, actually hunting that day, uh, setting a snare, and of course, uh, with her dog in a responsible manner, um, being able to bring food back to our people and her family. And gophers, yes, we eat in the Kalani region and Champagne er area. Uh, visitors, making sure that they stay safe. These are a couple of our guests, uh, dressed for success, not for failure. That's our job, part of our risk management. And I think it's important as a Yukon company, and while we, we are here, to provide that service to other incoming companies that we're seeing more from an international market. As well, we provide um, uh, a guide school program for our young people, up and coming generation, to understand what it's like to be in the backcountry and play on our land and work on our land responsibly. So this is Yukon Guide School that we do every year in June in um, our area. You wonder, how many people stop at this sign a year to get their picture? And uh, we are there quite a bit. And it also is sharing it with Alaska and our border and our tour companies and Holland America and all these other folks. And it is getting busy there. And it is our job, again, to be creative with our programming. Also, people, many of our visitors are wanting to get those amazing photographs and get to those amazing places. And this is an incredible photo that's actually in Kluwani. And uh, again, from a marketing perspective, it's important how we market the Yukon, and it is becoming a year-round destination. Here's one of our logos. Um, we have diversified, but we have also stuck to our values as a company. Um, we won the Sustainable Tourism Award uh, for all tour operators in the Yukon from tourism. We also just won the International Outfitter of the Year for North America. Um, and that is being sustainable as a company, walking lightly on the land, and only taking what you need and no, no more. This is a great picture of Thomas Dixon. It's all about customer service. It's all about, this is over 100 years ago. Him sitting there, having his morning coffee with his cook, getting fresh donuts. This is Thomas at the end of his season, as a businessman, going to town. Proud of his industry and what he has contributed. Um, some people might look at this picture and go, oh, but at the same time, it's, it's who he was and what he did to have to feed his family. He trapped, he hunted, he fished. These folks here, um, of course, we're getting winter. Winter market is just about the same as our summer market for visitors. And again, wanting to experience different things. This is minus 22. Are we going to be able to offer this in 20 years from now? We have to think outside as well with our parks and our campgrounds to become either year-round as our climate changes and our activities change on our land. Uh, photography, same thing. When we're marketing the Yukon and what we're doing and selling in our campgrounds and our parks, is it accurate to actually what is happening out there and what we're going to deliver as a government or as a private sector in partnership? Our visitors just aren't doing hiking, paddling, kayaking, they're also wanting cultural experiences. That's our, as our tourism lady said, exp uh, our cultural, our authentic experiences are the number one visitor right now. And that's a big market of ours. How are we sharing that? Is that gonna become a parks, a campground experience? Are you gonna work with private sector, public sector? Who's gonna deliver these programs and services? Are you gonna work with tourism businesses? or and create more jobs for government? These are all questions that people want and see in the campgrounds. Also, quiet and peacefulness and to have those wildlife viewing opportunities that everyone wants. You ask any visitor on any of our tour, the number one thing they want is to see wildlife. So how do we offer that and make sure we do it safely? And at the same time, yes, education, signage everywhere, but is that signage being effective? I see it and test it all the time. They're not reading the signs, folks. So what are we having to do different? And, and it's part of our job. And it's part of residents' and citizens' jobs as well, too, to educate the visitor in a meaningful way. Here's, um, uh, of course, this dock was Pine Lake. Um, 
remote lodging, accommodations is very important for our visitor experience. And whether it be under a shelter, at a campground, or at a park site, what is that going to look like 20 years from now? Do we have to? Are we going to stay rustic? Are we going to, is that our job? Or is that private sector's job? Or is it both of ours? Here, um, we were planning on going in winter tourism. I had, I didn't think I was going to be out 30 below on the, on the Skagway Road, but because I'm from here and know how, and know what the visitors want, of course, we've, we've changed, we've diversed. And of course, everyone's talking Aurora. Um, we need to do trips to Yellowknife to see the oversaturated market and what's going on, commercialism there. Is that what the Yukon wants? How, this is only the beginning with Northern Lights coming to the Yukon. So the next 20 years and winter activities in our campgrounds and parks is only going to be increasing with tourism. So how are we going to manage that as an operator, but also with our visitors? So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Tina. Don't go anywhere. I actually have a question, but we're close to nine. Does anyone in the audience have a question for Tina? My question. You've been in the business for a long time. When you think back to your roots and you get to today, what has surprised you the most? What has surprised me the most? Oh, that's a, bit, that's a good question. Um, we started as a company and we happen to just be indigenous, and I'm going to talk about, say that, First Nations, um, that the cultural experiences, the transportation, how we're going about the land, the traditional foods, what we're doing, our activities, that's changing, but that's just who we are, and we incorporate that in, and, and that's one of these fine balances, and um, I think that um, this next stage in that is, is a really important, and tonight, we should have had more First Nations here presenting. And we should have had just more citizens. And I know this is the start of it, but um, that, that's just one really important, important step that I need to see happening. Because it's been 25 years I've been in the business, and it's, it's a little bit going slow. And young people, thank you. And that's why I brought my daughter. She's in resource management. She works full time with our company. She's been um, in, in the saddle since she was six months old, um, dealing with high end uh, clients and guests, and on a day to her operation as well, seeing another whole market of, and we need to include our young people. So thanks. Um, that's, a, that's another really important one. Sector, if we're going to get a really great strategy, we need those people. They're our future. Thanks, Tina. And applause for Tina. <clears throat> Folks, it is one minute to nine, and I'm going to get you up by nine o'clock. As mentioned, if you have more questions, the parks team is here. We have some discussion stations that are connected to the discussion book, uh, booklet, whether it's how do parks and campgrounds support economic diversification? How, what do we need to sort of be asking in terms of thriving economy? What is the role of parks and, and campgrounds in terms of uh, creating places for people to become more healthy. These are some of the big questions we're grappling with. Um, Jean, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to tell us where to next from here, and then we are done. So, <laughs> where to from here? Um, uh, yes, and out the door and home. Um, uh, if you pick up Almost any piece of literature out there, it will have a website on it. You know what the website is. It's engageyukon.ca. And that is always the go-to place for up-to-date information on what happens next. Um, there, uh, we are doing still a number of community meetings and First Nations meetings, and, and we have a workshop tomorrow with some of the stakeholders. Um, so there's a bunch of that still going on. Uh, for your friends who are maybe less keen than you and maybe will only give us five minutes of participation in developing the strategy, there will be uh, this survey that will be going online in July. Um, and, um, and, and then there, there may be a gap in terms of the public participation while we develop the draft. And so in the winter, we will do, be doing this all this again 
but we'll be doing it in the way that works for people who like to have a draft to respond to and to change and edit and all that. So that's all coming in the winter. Um, and then hopefully by late next year, we'll have a final product that incorporates all that conversation. John. Okay, folks, that's it. Thank you very much for giving us your time. It's a, still a beautiful summer evening out there. Thanks again. Safe trip home. Uh, stay tuned. If you have questions, we'll be in the hall. Thanks again. Good night. <laughs>